Honestly, it was crazy. The amount of information was crazy. Resentment from parents of all of this great and nice and beautiful technology. You take Gaokao to enter a Chinese university, right? And students who already have a great score on the Gaokao, they, an extra month won't really make a difference. And students who fare really poorly on the Gaokao, an extra month also won't really make a difference. Welcome to a scholar talk where we sit down with experts and thought leaders and discuss some of the most prominent topics during the current situation. And today um, we'll start digging in one of the most fascinating areas that we've covered so far, which is education sector. And um, as we know, COVID-19 situation across the world has affected um, the way we conduct our everyday business practically in every sphere. Right, like right now we're sitting and we're conducting this interview um, uh, via Zoom, but education has also been affected and um, uh, worldwide uh, students are switching online because they cannot attend schools physically and many of them are preparing for their tests online in an on online mode too. And China in this regard is the country that we're gonna start with and it's one of the most interesting countries also to start with because it has uh, the world's largest uh, student population, right? It's been over two, I don't wanna lie, but it's been over 200 million students. Uh, let, me, let me double check uh, the, um, the figure itself. It's been uh, 278 million students who had to switch online for education across China. And the, the figure is staggering. The figure is very difficult to digest. But this is something that we will try to do today. And my name is Alessia Dovgaluk. Uh, joining me to discuss this today is my co-host, Ali Malimov. Well, thank you, Alessia. Thank you for this uh, introduction. And today we have with us two extraordinary researchers writing on the subject of education in China. Ekaterina uh, Kate uh, Galagriva is a sonologist who graduated from the higher school of economics with an MA in Asian studies. She currently works as an environmental assistant at Philanthropy in Motion in Beijing while receiving her second master's at the Yenching Academy of Peking University. And also we have with us Emma Schleifer, graduated in war studies from King's College, London, and is currently studying Chinese with foreign policy, Chinese foreign policy, is a Yanqing Academy scholar at Peking University, along with Kate. Hi there, welcome to Scholar Talk. So if we could jump in into your um, two really, really amazing articles that just came out in the past two weeks. The first one was Quarantined, China's Online Education um, During the Pandemic. And the second one, which just came out um, two days ago is the Gaokao in the time of COVID-19. Um, if uh, I could start with Emma. Emma, can you please briefly introduce the articles and let us know what actually prompted you to write about these articles uh, with Kate? Yeah, sure. So um, initially we looked at very specifically how, um, in, the, in the first article, I mean, how uh, China was coping with schools turning online. And I think one of the main reasons, I'm, I'm sure uh, Kate can also elaborate on this, but one of the main reasons is that uh, we, we were seeing a lot of, a lot of things uh, on, on uh, the impact uh, of, of uh, sorry, a lot of things on, on how uh, China had, had transitioned, the, like the facts, but it was, we, we weren't seeing as much on uh, the impact this was having uh, at very personal levels for uh, students, but also for teachers. And specifically, we're, we weren't seeing what the impact was for uh, uh, ed tech uh, companies. And so that was one of the main driving point uh, of the article was that we wanted to learn more about how the quarantine was really impacting these companies because obviously we you know we were hearing a lot of how it was a boom for this uh, ed tech scene how it was really going to be a lasting impact 
But uh, as we'll see later on, it turns out that actually we, we it, it was very interesting to go and talk to these companies because it's a much more nuanced uh, effect that this quarantine has had uh, on, on these companies. And so we wanted to combine all three aspects um, to give a, a, a broader and, and, and also but more deep overview into what really is the effect of, of moving an entire population of student online. So a lot of people were talking about this business going online, another business going online. And we just asked ourselves and like, because we have online classes and everything, how education went online. Uh, both Emma and I knew that ad tech market is huge in China and uh, our classes uh, go relatively successful. This is why we wanted to understand if uh, school kids cope uh, with the situation as successfully as students in the universities. And the second article, uh, it was actually also quite interesting. I think Peking University published the very short notice that uh, Gao Kao has been postponed. And Emma and I were immediately like, huh, we should write about that, we should check how people react to that. And actually, I think for us, the reaction was quite unpredictable and very interesting. When you, when you look at the very broad overviews of what is happening in the education industry right now in China, uh, there is a line that sometimes gets neglected. It is between the private e-learning platforms, private companies, private education providers, and schools. How much of the convergence uh, have you seen happening all during the COVID-19 times between these private platforms and uh, physical school education? Do you see uh, it converging? Do you see it as separate as it used to be? And how sustainable do you think uh, is this um, you know, relative success compared to other industries that education uh, platforms have experienced? So uh, the thing is, I've been working in ad tech sphere uh, during this fall and I would meet only private companies, so only private companies, um, let's say, presented their uh, works, innovations, and ideas during GET, uh, which is the education conference in Beijing. Uh, it takes place in November. It's the biggest education conference. And um, they, this, all, all these private companies rarely mentioned uh, anything public. Uh, no, none of them were talking about the cooperation between private and public. And started from that, uh, we thought uh, to check if COVID uh, changed the picture, changed the situation. But after we've talked to uh, specialists from the sphere, um, Emma, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think that all of them doubt that public and private will will eventually coincide and they still feel like there is a distance between them and they just go to pa parallel to each other. Yeah, something to add, and, and I agree with Kate a lot on this, um, but something to add as well is that while public and private companies might still uh, be very far from converging, I would, I would argue, um, there is another trend that sees a convergence, but not in the way that we'd expect, um, is that uh, there's a convergence of physical and uh, online companies in the sense that actually, some, and that's something that, that surprised us a lot uh, in our research is that uh, online companies are actually taking this opportunity not necessarily to expand massively online because they see that online expansion as something quite temporary and I think that the accounts from students and teachers were useful in corroborating that um, but they are using this uh, these this uh this unusual situation and this very unfortunate situation to um to also encroach on the physical space so because uh physical tutor like in classroom tutoring is still like a major, I would say probably the majority of the market at the moment in yeah, terms of tutoring. Uh, but they're done by, most of them are done by private uh, companies, uh, small companies who cannot work at the moment. Their classrooms are empty, their teachers are not teaching, but yet they still need to pay rent and they still need to pay their teachers' salaries. And the teachers are actually abroad at their, you know, uh, countries and they cannot go back. Exactly. And so that creates uh, a very, like, it's very draining for these companies financially. And what we, what was, what became very clear in our research is that uh, th it's very unlikely that 
uh, most of them will survive, uh, at least to the same extent. And so uh, it was interesting to see that online, online ed tech companies were thinking and already, not only thinking, but already kind of moving towards uh, opening uh, physical classrooms, opening physical tutoring centers. And so kind of not only, not moving away from the online uh, sphere, but supplementing it with the actually much more lucrative and much more common uh, physical tutoring. So that's something that was quite surprising, but it's, uh, it's, it shows the convergence in a very unusual way of the physical and the online, if not public. And, 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 and this is what make, uh, what will, is going to make uh, the whole business even more sustainable, I think. So it'll be more on the 50-50 side, basically the ad tech industry going more into the offline space, while the offline space today will gradually die during the COVID-19. Is like, that sort like, of a... Because like, you know, still we all believe in technologies and how beautiful they are and how amazing they are. But still, children have problems with studying online. The main problem is that parents should pay attention and parents should help. But unfortunately, the customers are not prepared. And usually parents don't really understand if their kid is learning or not, or maybe they just playing the laptop. Uh, they cannot be second teachers at home. So this is why a lot of Chinese families, they really love offline schools. At least, you know, you can bring your kid, leave, it, leave him or her for like three hours and feel like you've done your parent job. So you've answered partially my next question because not only the Chinese parents love their kids to be outside of their home and not just studying at home, but also I think worldwide that's the same um, nature of every parent. I am myself a parent of a seven-year-old and my kid goes to uh, the local Beijing uh, International School here. Uh, he's in elementary school, he's in first grade and they've been moved online and during that, uh, probably the last four months, uh, we've learned that it's not just the uh, uh, teachers and pupils that are studying, but also the parents. And majority of the work is not done by the student. Majority of the work is done by the parents. So you have the, uh, the tripod here, you know, between the teachers who are just assigning work and checking work. And then the parents who have to go and install the program, so there's a technological side to it, and then who has to explain everything that they've learned uh, to their uh, kids. And then at the end, they should also check the work and be there 20, basically four, seven, right, if you will. Uh, because it's very difficult for the kid, to, especially, you know, a seven-year-old, to stay there and be in front of a computer and study by himself. And uh, uh, my wife just, you know, yesterday basically said that uh, I deserve uh, a medal because she cannot, you know, be doing her uh, other work. So my question to you, Kate, because you've conducted the majority of the interviews, um, have you noticed that resentment from parents of all of this great and nice and beautiful technology, which actually unfortunately makes them work so much harder? Um, well, actually, I don't think that we even talked to parents uh, <laughs> properly. They're too busy, honestly. That, that could be your fourth article. <laughs> fourth article. But uh, uh, definitely, uh, while we were talking to experts from this sphere, they are talking to parents all the time, you know. Again, it's not the decision of a school child to come to an online school. It's the decision of their parents uh, to like take their children and bring to the school. So experts were telling that uh, parents uh, see um, online schooling to be quite problematic and quite, you know, time consuming and just frustrating for them. Emma, what do you think um, about parents issue? Yeah, um, I think that's a, that's a very fair point and one that I think still did come up in interviews with students as well. I mean, some students said that their parents were just happy that they were busy and didn't really have an opinion on online classes. But at the same time, and uh, I've since also conducted a, a few more interviews and 
it seems that because some some classes require uh, some systems sorry online online uh, tools require uh, parents signatures for instance um, or parents uh, presence even uh, when class begins for instance um, it, do, it does put a, a little bit of a strain that's for sure at least uh, on parents and and that strain gets greater as the child is younger and I think Olim, you, you said that very well as well if, if your child is and, seven and, 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 as, and as time goes and uh, as far as I understand you've been uh, interviewing for your first article probably starting like from a month or two months ago so uh, unfortunately we're still in the same situation and as time drags on uh, parents are growing more frustrated and it's not just with elementary uh, uh, students, but also, um, I'm not sure about high school. High school students are probably doing uh, much yeah, better because they're more adept. Yes, but up to middle school, that presents a huge challenge, mm -hmm. especially when you can't go outside and play, because we know yeah. that this you know, cannot continue for forever. I, I think this parents' range was uh, kind of felt uh, when we entered Weibo, to check the mm -hmm. comments about the second article about Gaokao and like schooling and everything. And there you could tell already that like parents and uh, a lot of high schoolers, they, they just, they cannot deal with this anymore. They just like, they want to drop everything. A <laughs> uh, very quick add on that, that just reinforces the point because it is a lot of pressure, um, especially as you get older for the children and the parents as well. So even though I, I think something to remember though is that the parents still are very, most of the parents that we talk to at least, are, are very invested in their child's education. And I think mm -hmm. that's very true across uh, across most uh, of the children that we that we interviewed and also just that we can see. Um, so they are very invested, but it's true that it's a lot of pressure for the students and for the parents. So uh, as Kate mentioned, even though it's, it's uh, no parents, I think, will will rage that much or complain that much in terms of of for their child's education in future it's still a big strain like you mentioned and so so um it's kind of like this this uh this uh, dichotomous but at the same time symbiotic relationship that exists mm -hmm. so it, it's interesting um but for sure I, I think most parents will be happy when kids go back to school but, but it's also it's, it's all it also seems to me that the teachers uh, are much uh, better off right now not having so many students in class and not having all that stress anymore you probably caught that on as well right i actually think that none of the teachers really enjoyed online classes really? or it's oh, hard okay. to communicate because i have to interview i don't know like more than seven teachers honestly it was crazy the amount of information was crazy none of them were happy they were like yeah there are good functions yeah, sometimes I don't need to repeat the class. Oh, it's easy to check the homework. Do you like it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's very true. That's that's something that came like that was one of the major trends. I think Kate, you'll agree that it was that it was seen as a very temporary fixture. Yeah. Um, very much so for the teachers. Pretty much so for the students. Some students were thinking of incorporating the online tools after uh, going back to school, but. That was not the majority, um, but the teachers, yeah, as you'll say, they were categorically against using that like as a replacement. But as a temporary fixture, they were, they were all right with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. as, as you said, it's, uh, it's it's getting more exhausting right now, especially now that it's it's been a couple of months of doing so, and for for both teachers and students, but especially so. Um, and I think it's it's a good time also to switch to maybe your second article, but especially so for the high schoolers who are now preparing. Gaokao, and that's uh, something that uh, you've discussed in your second article, right? The whole postponement of Gaokao uh, examination timelines, timelines in different cities uh, has created quite a lot of uh, debate within the Chinese society of whether it would actually be useful or it would just drain people more now that they are still uh, they still have to continue with this e preparation, right? Yeah, and like, uh, it's also very funny because Emma and I, we are kind of nerds, you know. So when we found this news, we were like, oh, probably all the school kids are so happy because you have like additional months, right? <laughs> and then uh, it was really, really hard to find anyone to have interview with because first of all, uh, high schoolers, they extremely busy right now. And uh, some of them don't even have phones with them. 
So for like before Gal Cup preparations, uh, schools require them to uh, take their phones away. And so uh, this is why we entered Weibo, you know, uh, the social network, and we wanted to see like the full picture and what people are thinking and how they are praising the postponing of Gal Cup. But actually, the comments were horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, what do you think about the comments? What was your reaction? They were quite interesting. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as saying that they were horrible, um, but I, I see what you, what you would mean by that. But um, yeah, they, they were very some interesting. Some of them, they were horrible. <laughs> no, but in, in the sense that, um, I mean, there were a few that were in favor, as we would have expected, yeah. in terms of saying, especially from r rural students or students with very poor internet connections or students with, with, who had difficulty um, mm -hmm. being online. I, and that was one of the main reasons why the Galka was postponed officially. It was to give a fair chance for students uh, mm -hmm. across the board who may have been negatively impacted by the, by the moving online. Um, and for those, I think, and I think it's a testament as well to the, to the fact that it was perhaps the right decision to take uh, in, for, for that, because a lot of students who, who seem to have been disadvantaged by the moving online were very positive about um, the gal cow being postponed. And I think that's, that's a very important point to highlight is that for those that the postponement, postponement was for, they were very happy about this. But for those that did not have maybe as much difficulty uh, with the online uh, movement, who perhaps had, 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 uh, had, were still doing quite well, et cetera, um, for, for them, they, like Kate, Kate said, they were very against moving the gal cow Back. Yeah, the question is if they're majority or not. So, like, uh, again, we should keep in mind, people in Weibo who were raging about everything, they're like, uh, uh, you know, kids from relatively good families with mobile phones who can sit and spend their time on Weibo, <laughs> saying that Gaokao is just like, I don't just want to pass it, I don't want to wait for it anymore. But at the same time, we are talking to the student from Hubei province and her internet connection is really bad. She doesn't have a laptop. She has like a very bad phone and sometimes she has to go on the rooftop. Can you that imagine? was powerful. That was a powerful story actually. To have like, uh, to take part in the online class, it's horrible. And of course for her this month can actually change just something. Like Gao Kao is so competitive that even few additional balls that she can receive can like make a big difference. But also it's important to look at what's going to happen next, right? Because Gaokao is, you take Gaokao to enter a Chinese university, right? Um, has there been any information that you found um, regarding the, maybe the changes in the admissions procedures across the universities in China in the, in the current situation? Emma, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, we, we did find a, a lot of things, not, but it's important to note that not all of them were related to the postponement itself. Some of them were related to more um, long-seated uh, concerns over uh, misuse of previous systems. So um, there, there are two things I think to highlight here is that one of them is uh, in order, because the government I think is very aware that um, the Gaokao is a very difficult exam. Uh, it, it tries to be very fair, but obviously, as with any system and any, any exam, it has some failings um, or, or some areas where, where it can be misused to some extent. And so the government did try to, to help universities to, to um, admit students through other routes than just the Gaokao. Um, and there were several tracks. Uh, I won't go all into them, but there were several tracks that universities could use to, to, to do that. Um, but recently, because because of the uh, because of the, um, the the potential misuses of the systems and uh, more awareness, I think of of universities having some uh, scandals and, and some misuse of, of that. Uh, the government this year, actually, like two months ago, decided to replace uh, the, those tracks that used Galcao a lot less, Galcao scores a lot less, in favor of a system that was much more in a return to using Gaokao. So I think now the system that universities can use to admit students, not just based on off um, Gaokao scores, still is based on the Gaokao scores to 85%. So it still uses the Gaokao scores to a great extent, just not 100%. 
Um, so that's one thing that the government has tried to, to help universities kind of change their approach to admissions for, for students who may not score that well in the Gaokao. Um, but it, it, it shows that the system is, is still perhaps one of the, the, the best ones so far in terms of admitting students because it, it seems to kind of, it, it, it persists very much. And even when universities try to move away from it, it comes back. So, so that's one thing, but that's not really related to the postponement of the Gaokao this year. And the second trend that we saw for uh, Gaokao postponement, uh, the, the major thing that will really affect students is just that all the timeline will be, post will be delayed as well. But it doesn't really change how, or at least it hasn't been said how um, it will affect them beyond the delay. One thing that has come up though is the cutoff points for university admissions. Those change every year. Um, depending on you know the like the diffi difficulty of the exam, how many students take it, etc. So the cutoff point does change every year, and the fact that students have had an extra month to prepare, uh, or some of them to come back to to the level that they would have had with, without online uh, classrooms, um, it it will perhaps affect the cutoff point. Um, and some students have mentioned that it might heighten them. Uh, and make it more difficult because people have had more time to prepare. But at the same time, I think a majority of students don't feel that it will necessarily affect it that much because um, something that came up really was that students who already have a great score on the Gaokao, they an extra month won't really make a difference. And students who fare really poorly on the Gaokao, an extra month also won't really make a difference. Mm -hmm. So it really will only make a difference for those, those students who are kind of like wavering on the edge, um, you, you might have like, for instance, the girl in Hubei, uh, she, she will use the extra month to polish her English, which she was really scared for, uh, uh, of for her, for her gal cow. So it, it will help those students, but it won't necessarily make, I think, a huge difference as to how university admissions are conducted. What will make a bigger difference is the, the, the recent changes in the, the tracks for admissions out of the gal cow. Um, but these were, uh, these were these come from before the 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 COVID nineteen situation. Emma is absolutely right, and uh, also it is worth mentioning that in two thousand sixteen, China tried to adjust uh, the enrollment ratio and tried to um, provide more spaces uh, for for people from rural areas um, in bigger universities. The thing is that a lot of professors and a lot of even students, they worry that those who are coming from rural areas, they might not have enough, you know, uh, knowledge and stamina and abilities to keep up with, for example, PTU program. And um, last year, actually, there was a bit of a scandal when PTU didn't want to accept a student uh, from a very rural area with relatively low uh, points, even though they were supposed to. And uh, people started arguing uh, if PTU should make uh, such a decision or not, because at some point you are talking about the fairness of Gaoka, right? And if the student doesn't have abilities, then he is not, it was a boy, he's not supposed to study in such a university. But at the same time, can you imagine uh, him studying for four years, definitely learning more than he could ever expect, and then going back to his hometown, or I think it was like a very bad village, and he could teach, uh, he can start uh, teaching um, people there, uh, not even children, but like, adults and everything but at the same time you should understand that some of these people will go back to their hometowns and they will bring up the level of education themselves if you're gonna give them a chance i wouldn't want to even imagine how hard of a um how hard it is to create a system in the country of 1.3 billion people it's and <laughs> and i think you guys are and i think you're doing an incredible job of being uh, objective and uh, try to see all of the different facets um, of the system and it seems that the government is really trying to be fair right I mean that's that's what we want from our governments but even uh, but even in fairness of course there's uh, there's losers and there's winners and just like you said I mean there's so many students that are 
uh, that have been studying for Gaoka since the time they were babies, basically, right? It's all they could think about, Gaokao, Gaokao. And I've, seen, I've been in China for 12 years, and um, uh, there were many uh, occasions where I would go into a local deli, and I would see uh, a family. This is a family business, and I would see uh, one kid in the back always studying uh, day and night, and he would grow, you know, uh, in those 10 years, and then he would study for those uh, Gaokaos. And today, I wouldn't even imagine those kids were going to school and all of a sudden now they have been put in the position of uh, having the online education and of course that doesn't put everybody in a fair position especially if you're in a city and then if you're in a rural area so the government of course here has to uh, think about the other 40 percent or 45 percent of the population and of students that are coming from the rural areas. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions that I have right now, um, the semester, as we know, usually ends in around uh, June and the beginning of July. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the situation like right now? When will the semester, is there such thing as a semester now? Will people graduate? And when will the next semester start? I really hope we can graduate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that's something very close to to us as well. Um, because I, I think also just just on what you said, I think it's it's very important, and I I want to be super clear in that um, as someone outside, as people outside the system, as you mentioned, it's 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 un, it's you you can't put yourself to the same extent in in people in people's shoes and people who who who, who study for the Gao Cao, people who make the Gao Cao, any of that system, you, you really can't get a, as clear an idea, I think. And for that, I think you'd really have to talk to, to people who, who are in the system and who have experienced uh, that system. Um, and like, like you mentioned, like, like Kate mentioned, I think it, is a t it was something that was very clear in what we saw is that the government is trying to create a system that is, that is as fair as possible. As you say, of course, it, you know, it's very difficult to have a 100% fair system uh, in, anywhere. Um, but especially in, in such a large country, in, in a country where the, the education is valued as well so, so much, I think it is a testament to, to, to the system that, that it has worked more or less okay. I, I think for all its failings, it, it does have its, its, its benefits. I do believe that at some point they will adjust to new realities. And so, for example, what happens a lot in China these kids who are studying for like 12 years uh, for Gaokao, they are going crazy, like literally. They pass the Gaokao, they enter the university. After that, they are not motivated. Uh, the thing is that online education, which develops some sense of creativity, the ability to self-study and everything, it actually can bring uh, colors to their life. So they will still be crazy about Gaokao, they will still, you know, prepare for Gaoka, but because they know that you can have fun while self-studying, because they know that through online resources, you can learn something apart from school in the university, they might have like a brighter reality um, after all. And at the same for rural area kids, I think uh, online education will first of all help them to you know, have access to some of the classes, especially to language classes. Uh, but also, I think that in many many mega cities, uh, in a lot of uh, like very stable middle class families, especially in the south, school kids don't they they start you know tend not to want to go to the university. They start believing that maybe university is not something that, as important because you just can do business. And you can imagine that if this kid won't go to the university and they will start immediately working, then these places can be given to the people from rural area. So I think the system itself will, you know, um, make adjustments and uh, be flexible by itself. But to go back to your question, though, I, I think also like just on the terms of uh, of w w will there be a summer term, will there be a, a spring term, anything? Um, it's true that we, I mean, 
I personally really hope that we can go back very soon. Um, and I hope that's true of everyone. Um, but that is also something that, that was noted is that students who were um, a little bit unsure whether they liked the gallery to be postponed was that they, they are afraid that they won't have a summer term. Um, and I think that's kind of being left to the purview of each province and even of each municipality of whether, and sometimes even of each school, to decide whether there will be a, a summer term or not, to decide whether students can, can have a bit of a, a, few, a few weeks off at least. Um, but that's, that's, that hasn't really been decided yet. Um, I, I'm sure there will be at least a few weeks of holidays or, of, or at least of, uh, of downtime, let's say, um, to some extent. Just, just by nature of the Gao being in July and university starting a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's been, the, the arrangements and the details are being largely left to, um, to local levels, but I yeah. hope that we can go back soon. <laughs> I also hope so, but I do think that a lot of universities will postpone the entrance uh, time and they will also probably, there is a chance that they're gonna postpone the autumn semester and especially, you know, for newcomers who first of all have their army training, I think it would be like relatively easy. Uh, maybe they will do the army training sh like shorter, but I do think they're gonna change the schedule for the next semester. They, they might, they really might, because, uh, and we've been hearing it from the news lately that there have been dates for the reopening of some schools. The dates were announced, but for the university, also in the PKU University, this is something that has been communicated that they are very, very careful with reopening for both this semester and the next semester, primarily because uh, students in Chinese universities tend to live together, talking about Chinese students, of course, and, and they're they clusters, clusters in, clustered in rooms and it's a much easier environment I mean, God forbid, but a much easier environment. If something was to happen, then the virus would spread very, very quickly. So let's, I mean, I also hope that you can come back very, very quickly because I haven't had a chance to meet uh, the new cohort of the uh, Yinchin Academy yet, but let's see. Um, I wanted to, because we're like um, naturally nearing uh, the, the end of the conversation. I was, I was wondering, these were the two big topics that you've covered in your first articles, right? The edutech, uh, and the Gao Kao, and I know that you're working on the third piece. Um, obviously, we will uh, we'll link uh, to, in the description to these videos in our social media platforms, uh, links to your first two articles so that readers can also uh, go and have a read after they finish watching this episode. Uh, could you give us a little preview of what you're writing on right now? Yeah, give us the scoop. <laughs> I do think that we have several ideas, and one of the ideas is to show the ad tech market because after these uh, articles have been published, a lot of people would ask us, uh, what are the companies? What is the percentage of the companies? How the market looks like? It seems like it's big. It seems like they have a lot of money, but what is the ad tech market in China, right? And we do have some, uh, you know, information. <laughs> so <laughs> we might share it. For sure, yeah. And I think actually um, you bring up a good point is that there are competitive systems in, in many countries um, and some of them are actually, I mean, obviously Gaohao is, is, I don't want to diminish uh, people going through it because it's it sounds uh, very intense. Um, but there are countries who have at least equally intense uh, exams and, and, and life-changing um, uh, pathways to go through, uh, like all the, like, you know, challenges and, and kind of exams to go through. And I think it would, be, that's another idea that we had is that it would be interesting to see how uh, quarantine measures or, or moving online or ed tech has, has um, affected uh, people in the countries and also not just in countries with, with uh, education systems that have uh, strong exam components, but also in countries who have coursework components. So for instance, uh, of course, the IB um, has been uh, canceled this year. I think uh, I, I know a lot of people who are very happy about that, but also um, it is it is also a cost benefit kind of, uh, kind of thing because some people were relying on the exam to kind of bring up their coursework, et cetera. But so just the point is that um, the, these are effects that have, have affected a lot of country, different countries with very different different education systems, and it would be very interesting to kind of do a not not uh, to do a little comparative analysis as to the effects. So also, what I remembered about is that um, a lot of children who don't pass Gaokao successfully, they go to study abroad. Can you imagine 
what is going right now in their families and in their heads and what they're gonna do because there is a high chance that they're not gonna you know um, go and study abroad so it's very interesting to also look at this part uh, a lot of um, English proficiency tests were cancelled right and so they cannot pass the tasks they cannot make visas they cannot apply what they're gonna do it's just I think it's quite interesting yeah probably take a year off and uh, maybe work I think their parents are so happy about it but also something something that to note is that not only are the tests like logistical logistically it's going to be difficult for students who want to go abroad to, to actually go abroad yeah. but also because of the backlash that's been going on um especially in the u.s a little bit in the uk um against foreign students um especially chinese students unfortunately um it's very very sad thing um and that has had an impact um it's starting to appear I, i've talked to a few students who who are, it hasn't necessarily discouraged them to to go but it has made them think twice about going abroad and obviously it's hard to judge the effects right now this will have but it, it's going to be interesting once the logistical challenges kind of ebb to see how strong the, the the sentiment holds um it's it's interesting that a few students have commented that it, it has made them think twice about applying a lot emma kate thank you so much for this profound conversation we've learned a lot so thank you for being here and we hope that we get we can catch up with you soon thank you thank you very much for having us it was a great discussion